So we're going to start off talking about uh, building models of gravitational wave data, which is effectively uh, how you set up your likelihood function and then ultimately whatever algorithm you use to sample from that likelihood function. Uh, mostly thinking about it in a LIGO context, but also in a, in a broader picture as well. So Katerina gave a, a nice little overview, um, but you, you have to start off with, with Bayes' theorem, which tells you how uh, conditional probabilities sort of interact with one another. And we'll see lots of these lowercase p type functions uh, throughout the course of the day. And so those uninitiated, uh, when you see this vertical bar in the argument of the probability density, the thing on the right-hand side of the bar is considered given. And the thing on the left-hand side of the bar is then therefore the, uh, the dependent variable. And so if you have, uh, if you want to know the probability of A given B, you can set it up this way uh, and, and compute that probability or probability density rather mechanically. In the context of parameter estimation, then the thing that you want to know about are your model parameters uh, here represented with theta. And the things that are, that those, uh, parameters are conditional on are the data that you've observed and also your model for the data that you're observing. Uh, oftentimes folks leave out the condition on the model because it shows up in every single term and so is kind of redundant and makes the equations rather messy. But I uh, want to be pedantic about it for reasons that will soon become clear. And then your different pieces of the likelihood of the um, Bayes' theorem here are the likelihood function the prior and the evidence, which we are going to talk about, uh, even though Katerina wanted to skip over that one. And then the left-hand side here is, is usually the thing that you are most after, which is the, the posterior probability density for your model parameters. All right, so let's say someone hands you a likelihood function and also hands you a prior. Those are the things that the, the analyst has to sort of come up with. And then you can shove them into your favorite Bayesian sampler and turn the crank and out pop the answers to your inference problem, which are the, the posterior. And if you want to do a little bit of extra work, then you can get this, this model evidence as well. OK, that's great. So let's talk about what the posterior means at first. Uh, so the, the output of one of these ACME uh, sampling algorithms would be a bunch of random numbers that are distributed consistently with the posterior distribution function. And so what that means is you can take a small volume delta V in your parameter space and count up how many of your samples live inside of that volume and divide by the total number of samples that you have all together. And that tells you the probability that the true model parameter lives somewhere inside of that volume. This is a very handy way of representing these extremely multidimensional and complicated distributions because you might have a bunch of parameters in your model that you don't necessarily care about. They're not all that physically meaningful, but they're important to, if it's a gravitational wave search, they're important to say modeling the, the actual waveform. These are traditionally called nuisance parameters. And it's a real hassle to deal with nuisance parameters if you don't adopt this formalism. But if you do, you just sample over them and then ignore them when you make plots and you have automatically marginalized over them. So you're, you're doing very complicated high dimensional integrals without really having to think about it, which is pretty handy. And a very common way of representing these posterior distribution functions are the beloved corner plots, which show you different two dimensional projections of this large dimensional uh, model. And the contours then enclose different probability so in this example, the, the dark purple uh, contours contain the 50% probability. That means that the true value is, is most like, is, you know, has 50% probability of being inside those dark purple contours. And then the lighter purple contours are say the 90% probability uh, intervals and so on and so forth. And if you, if you think about uh, your parameters as like a big correlation matrix or a covariance matrix. The, the 1D distributions are the diagonal elements. And then these different um, 2D projections would be the off dial diagonal elements. So then it would be symmetric this way. Um, although if you, if you think about covariance matrices a whole lot, then, then maybe that's 
that's already quite natural to think about it that way. But you can just pick out, you know, which parameters in your covariance matrix would have would have high correlations. Like in, in this example from a from simulated LISA data, uh, a binary in our galaxy would have a strong correlation between its measured frequency and first derivative of its frequency, for example. All right, the other thing that pops out of your sampler, uh, depending on the sampler, and if you're willing to do a little post-processing maybe, is this thing called the evidence. And if you look at the structure of the evidence and you compare that to the structure of the likelihood, they look awfully similar. Uh, so the likelihood is the probability that you'd see some data given a certain set of parameters for a model. And the evidence is the probability that you'd see the data you've got given the model. So this is marginalized over all of the model parameters. Um, so sometimes it's also called the marginal likelihood. So you compute it by taking the uh, posterior basically and normalizing it. It's the normalization part of the posterior. So you just integrate likelihood times prior over your full model. Uh, the reason you do that is because it gives you a way to quantitatively compare different models for the data. So let's say I have one model that says I've detected a bunch of gravitational waves. I wanna shove that likelihood in prior into my sampler and out pops a likelihood. I might have another model that says there are no gravitational waves, it's just instrument noise. I shove that through my sampler, out pops another likelihood. And I whack that with my prior odds on those two models. And what I get is the odds ratio, which is a number which can be interpreted as the betting odds basically between model A and model B. So if the odds ratio is five, that means I prefer model A over model B at five to one odds. So maybe not necessarily take that one to the bank, but you feel pretty good about it. Just the likelihood ratio part is called a base factor. Oftentimes when you read papers about this stuff, they'll quote base factors and wave their hands away from the uh, prior odds ratios because that's where you get into lots of arguments. Um, but when it's all said and done, this is just a way of quantitatively comparing models. Okay, now, important caveat is that this is not magic. It is, a, it is a nice mechanical way of doing some big integrals, but if you shove a garbage model into your Acme Bayesian sampler, what you get out is garbage posteriors and garbage uh, evidences. And so what we're going to talk about is how to make sure that you're feeding a good healthy model into your sampler so that when you are interpreting your results, which all are conditional on that model, you're not accidentally uh, fooling yourself. Okay, so to do that, we're going to build the likelihood function from the ground up. So let's start with some data that has no gravitational wave signals. And in a perfect world, that means our uh, detector would just record a whole bunch of zeros for us. But of course, it's not a perfect world and our detectors have noise in them. So we're gonna say our data is at least just a bunch of noise. And then if we're lucky, then it also contains some gravitational wave signal going by. So in general, it's safe to assume that the gravitational wave signal is a small perturbation to the whole data, which is generally noise dominated. This will change in the 2030s, but this is a pretty fair representation of where we are right now. So to build our likelihood, we have to model the data, the noise and the signals. The noise is stochastic, that's why it's noise. And so the way we model noise is statistically. The signal part, the way you model that kind of depends on what you're doing. So if you're looking at discrete sources, then you model the signal coherently. So you're, if it's time domain data, you're looking for a gravitational wave as a function of time. If it's frequency domain data, it's gravitational wave as a function of frequency. So at each sample, you wanna, at each data sample, you wanna have a prediction of what the signal looks like. Uh, if you're looking for uh, backgrounds, be they cosmological backgrounds or just a bunch of co-added sources that you can't individually resolve, then you model the gravitational wave statistically. And I think over the course of the day, we're gonna hear uh, stories looking at this problem in both ways. But we're gonna focus for the moment on the single source sort of coherent picture. So first we'll start with our model for the noise. Our gravitational wave detector noise is a consequence of lots of little things jiggling around. And so it's a fair assumption to say that that noise has some zero mean and is Gaussian distributed. 
We're also going to assume that we know the variance of the noise. We, we know sort of from first principles or other measurements how much the data is jiggling around at a particular sample i. So then we can calculate the probability, given that we read out some data, which it, we're going to assume is just noise for the moment. We can read, we can calculate the probability that we would have gotten that, which is just evaluating the Gaussian with zero mean. All right. Well, if you stick a little bit of gravitational wave on top of there, and you assume that you don't have any calibration issues in your data, and you also assume that you don't have any issues modeling the gravitational waveform, then let's see, I need to move my face out of the way. There we go. Then you can compute the probability that you would see the data D as again, evaluating the Gaussian where now you're taking the data and you're subtracting off the gravitational wave part. So all that's left is the noise and the noise should follow this Gaussian distribution. Okay, now it won't let me advance the slide, there we go. All right, so now we don't have just a single sample of data, we have an ensemble of data. And so if we have, let's say K samples of data, then the probability of measuring all K of those is the joint probability of measuring the noise in each single one of them. And so now D is a vector. And instead of the variance that was here in the previous slide, we get the noise correlation matrix. And so there's this sort of implied sum. You have the vector of all of your data samples minus your waveforms, the noise co uh, covariance matrix, and then the, that vector again. And then this normalization piece that most folks leave out. Okay, now is when the magic happens. So if we assume that the noise is stationary, and what that means is that the variance does not depend on time, then a miracle occurs. And if you take the Fourier transform of the data or the noise, and you look at its inner product with itself, the only non-zero terms are the diagonal terms. So the, the only non-zero terms are the noise from sample I times the noise from sample I. So if you think about this big covariance matrix, it is a diagonal matrix and all the off diagonal terms are zero. And so this big complicated bunch of multiplications that you have to do actually gets really simple. You're just summing over the each frequency bin of the data. And so in the perfect world, where you have stationary noise, it's really, really convenient to do your analysis in the Fourier domain, which is why if you read lots of gravitational wave data analysis literature, it all just starts and finishes its job in the frequency domain because it makes this nice diagonal covariance matrix. Now, I should point out that our friends in pulsar timing land are well outside of this regime and have done Herculean work to calculate likelihoods not depending on just taking big Fourier transforms and having diagonal uh, covariance matrices. And I think you'll hear all about that like two or three talks from now. Okay, so we can rewrite this in possibly a more familiar form. And this is the likelihood that you'll see thrown in as equation one in lots of papers talking about gravitational wave data analysis. So that likelihood is built on these five key assumptions that the noise is zero mean and Gaussian, we know its variance, its variance is holding still for us. We have no problems with calibration and we have perfect waveform models. And five of those assumptions are wrong. Basically that the noise is not Gaussian. We do not know its variance. Its variance is moving around out from under us. There are calibration issues and our waveform models aren't perfect. So what I'm going to focus on for I think the remainder of my time is the noise part of all of this. I'm going to totally ignore the calibration issues and the waveform modeling issues, those will come later. But on the right-hand side are examples of where our assumptions about the noise fall apart in ground-based interferometric data, LIGO-Virgo data. So the top panel shows time frequency plots of the detector noise doing extremely non-Gaussian things. So you can think of this as like a heat map where yellow means lots of excess power. And if the detector noise was nice and Gaussian, it would just be big blue squares. And instead you see these very bright yellow excursions in the LIGO Virgo parlance. These are referred to as glitches. They're basically the detectors doing something funky. On the right-hand side, or sorry, <laughs> below that uh, are a view of the power spectral density of the detector data as a function of frequency over the course of, I believe this was the first observing run, 01. 
And the blue and red bands, so blue would be the data from the Livingston detector, red would be the data from the Hanford detector, and the envelope around there shows you roughly how much this power spectral density fluctuates over the course of the observing run, which is quite a bit. So you couldn't say, write down what the power spectral density is, which you use as, your, um, as the variance in your noise model, and just run with that for the entire observing run. You, you sort of have to continuously monitor whatever that variance is doing during any small segment of data. So one way to get around all of this is to build a very large model and use Bayesian model selection to tell you what is going on in the data. So we have a pithy um, motto, which is to model everything and let the data sort it out, which is shorthand for saying, look at your data, find some convenient way to parameterize it in mostly a phenomenological way. There's our features, so figure out a way to parameterize those features. And then use evidence, the, the Bayesian evidence, to decide how many of those features you actually need to include in the model at any given time. So this is the longhand version of our, of our rather, rather pithy motto. So here is an example of this at work. This is a zoomed in view of some LIGO data uh, power spectrum as a function of frequency. And there are two main features in the, in the detector noise I wanna draw your attention to. The first is that it has lots of these very narrow band spike-like features, uh, which we'll refer to as spectral lines. They come from a variety of different things like resonances in the detectors or intentionally uh, making the mirrors oscillate for calibration purposes or at 60 Hertz here because they're all plugged into the US power grid, at least the, the LIGO observers, uh, detectors are. And then there's also this sort of broadband flatter noise level. So we could break up our noise into a sort of two component model, one piece that deals with the broadband part of the noise and one piece that deals with the spiky bit of the noise. And so we have an algorithm that we use in LIGO for this purpose, which measure, which models the broadband noise using uh, a number of control points and then an interpolation between those control points to fill in the gaps. Oh, and then the, the spiky bit are modeled as sums of Lorentzians for, for good reasons, which we can get into if you're into it. And so by having this model, that, that sort of reproduces the features in the noise spectrum, we can take care of the fact that we don't necessarily know the noise variance a priori and sort of kind of take care of the stationarity bit as long as the noise is stationary over the interval that we're observing. So let's say we have some gravitational wave transient and we use this model to analyze the data along with the gravitational wave signal over like a few seconds as long as the noise is stationary over that few seconds, this is a perfectly adequate model and our likelihood that it has the diagonal covariance matrix is good to go. If we go to longer and longer segments of data, then that assumption starts to get a little squirrely again and we need to do a little bit more work to figure out how to deal with it. So we're sort of, sort of okay on this assumption depending on the circumstances, but we haven't touched the, the non-Gaussian part of it. So now let's look at the non-Gaussian part of it. Here's some more LIGO data. Uh, it's a whitened time series of, of some LIGO data that has one of these big noise transients sitting right here. So this is one of these glitches. This is a very common type of glitch in the data. And the way we've constructed a model to fit these noise transients is by using a convenient basis function. In this case, wavelets are a very nice basis function. So they're sort of Gaussian enveloped uh, sinusoidal functions, and you can adjust how damped those functions are. And so glitches, which are you know short duration wiggly things, can be well represented by a linear combination of a bunch of short duration wiggly things. Now I'll point out that the wavelets that we use are not orthogonal. There are orthogonal wavelet bases out there. We've experimented with them and for long tedious reasons, have settled on these non-orthogonal wavelets. We can get into it if you'd like. But if I take these two wavelets and add them together, I get a nice faithful representation of this glitch that was in the data. And so I basically fit out the glitch that's in the data and the residual gets us back to that Gaussian assumption and makes our likelihood good again. 
Of course, the mystery is how did I know to use two wavelets and not three and not one and not 10? So, uh, right, now we've also taken care of the sort of non-Gaussian excursions that our data might enjoy by using this sum of wavelets. But it turns out that another type of non-Gaussian excursion that's quite interesting in the data are gravitational waves. So I don't know if anyone can pick this one out by eye. We know this one very well. This is GW150914, the first gravitational wave directly detected. And I can model GW150914 with a sum of, let's say, five or six of these wavelets. So those are the individual wavelets in the fit. And if I add them all together, I get a nice looking chirp waveform without having to use a you know, numerically, numerical relativity or uh, analytic relativity inspired template. And since I know based on the relative locations of the detectors, if I have a signal in one for a particular sky location, I can predict what the signal looks like in the other detectors. I can have a phenomenologically built model for gravitational wave signals that, does, that doesn't use templates. And so the only difference between this model and the model that assumes that these are all glitches is that the glitches are considered independent in the different detectors and the signal has to be coherent between the different detectors. And so now I also have an insurance policy on the waveform modeling, although it's not a particularly strict insurance policy, it still is nice to know that we have a way of analyzing these gravitational wave signals, even if they go beyond where we have uh, good predictive models so far, like one day when there's a core collapse supernova in the galaxy, uh, methods like this will be super handy to do uh, signal reconstructions because we don't have templates for those types of sources. All right, so if you put it all together, we have lots and lots of parameters. So we have parameters for the, the spline part of, whoops, parameters for the, the, the broadband noise part of the model. We have a bunch of parameters for the spectral lines. We have parameters for the glitches. We have parameters for signals if we don't use templates and or if we do use templates and maybe some calibration parameters, we have this massive model that we now have to shove into our sampler. And one of the tricky things is that these parameters here, the actual number of these features that we need in the data also have to be free parameters. So you could imagine, I'm just gonna try out all the different combinations of how many wavelets I need and how many Lorentzians I need and do all of my evidence comparisons after the fact that gets uh, the combinatorics there get overwhelming very quickly. And so what we wanna be able to do is just marginalize over all of these models instead of having to discreetly process each individual one of them and then do all of our evidence comparisons at the end. And so for that, we're not gonna be able to use our regular off the shelf Bayesian sampler. We need something a little bit fancier that requires a lot of tender loving care, um, but that's job security. And for that, we, the models described here are quite fond of trans-dimensional or re reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlos. There are probably other ways to do it, but this is the one I know best. Um, the idea here is that one of your parameters in your sampler is a parameter that controls which model it is you're sampling. So in normal sort of Bayesian parameter estimation land, you are stuck in a single representation of the data, a single model, and then you're moving around uh, within that model to sample the posterior, what the uh, transdimensional Markov chains allow you to do is hop between models as well. So you might have one model where you just have a single source moving around or a single wavelet or a single Lorentzian and another model where there might be two, another one where there might be three. And this uh, type of sampler allows you to transition between those models and still have all the nice statistical rules about detailed balance satisfied so that when you you, you get statistically unbiased results out at the end of the day. And so you can compute your odds ratios just directly from uh, the counts in your, in, in your sampler by saying, you know, the, the odds ratio for model A versus model B would be how much time my sampler spent in one model versus how much time my sampler spent the other. So you get your, your base factors, your odds ratios for free-ish. Uh, in this kind of analysis, instead of having to have some like post-processing step to compute those things. So here is an example of it at work. So what we've done here is we've taken some real LIGO data with a real LIGO glitch, which is right here at T equals zero. 
And then we've added on top of that data, a simulated gravitational wave signal, which is merges, it's a CBC that merges just a little bit after. And then the video here shows you our trans-dimensional multifaceted phenomenological model at work. So you have a bunch of wavelets, the coherent ones are fitting the signal in all the detectors, any sort of excess power that's not coherent gets eaten up with glitch wavelets. And then simultaneously we have our cubic spline model for the broadband noise wiggling around and our Lorentzians fitting the lines. And you can see features sort of come in and out as the uh, sampler is exploring different parameter spaces, so different models. And then at the end, you can look at the posterior of your, of your model space. So uh, on the far left, these would be the posterior on the number of wavelets being used in the signal model and in the glitch model for the different detectors. Here's the posterior on the spline points. Here are the posteriors on the Lorentzians. We don't actually care about anything here, right? These, these are just phenomenological models. What we actually care about is the, the sort of reconstruction of the data. And so we can look at posteriors for what we think the noise was doing. So I don't know if you squint, you can see a little uncertainty bands around our, our you know, final fit to the noise model. And same goes for the signal. So we're able to extract the gravitational wave signal uh, in the different detectors and then fit up any excess noise using the glitch model, even though the glitch power is sitting right on top of the signal power in this simulation. All right, so it all seems great. Everyone should use transdimensional samplers for everything that they do. I'm here to warn you that it's a little bit tricky. Uh, these samplers are very difficult to get to mix robustly. And it's because these model transition steps uh, have a lot going against them in the mechanics of how the sampler operates. So if you're familiar with, with uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms, the thing that sort of governs how well your sampler is moving around is this thing called the transition probability which is the probability of transitioning from one state to the other. So in this case, our example is transitioning from state M0 to state M1. And the difference between M0 and M1, M0 has just like a sim single set of parameters X and M1 would have two different sets. So this would be like a single wavelet model and a two wavelet model, for example. In that case, the transition probability has the likelihood ratio. It has the ratio of the priors. And then it has this piece, which is the proposal density, which says uh, basically, how did I choose my parameters for the, the extra set, the, the set labeled with the index one uh, for this transition? And nothing here is helping you transition. So the likelihood ratio is often much, much less than one, unless you happen to land on a place where your X1 set of parameters is close to a good part of the posterior. So basically, if you just randomly introduce new parameters to your model, you're probably going to do more harm than good to the fit. So this number often ends up being much less than one. So it's a low probability of being accepted. And even if it's close to one, you pay a penalty for the extra prior volume that you've introduced. So this sort of degrades the uh, transition probability. And then you also pay a penalty if you have a very heavy handed proposal that says, ooh, this looks like a good place in parameter space, go there a lot. And so there's a lot working against you here to get these transitions to be accepted. And what the out here is to have very carefully tuned proposal distributions that you use in your sampler to do these trans-dimensional moves. That requires a lot of thought. So you have to think a lot about just the model space that you're trying to explore and use some domain knowledge to build these distributions. And it also, benefits from having some sort of data-driven way. So having a way of, of taking the data, maybe doing some pre-processing to build proposal distributions based on the data in hand. And it also helps to uh, have a good way to get the models initiated. So basically give them a, a helping hand during their burn-in step. So if you just sort of start all your parameters off and start off in a totally random model, then the, the burn-in time can be very tricky. Uh, one particular sort of nefarious way that this works is if you have really good proposals, but no help with burn-in. So let's say, uh, so this example comes from some simulated LISA data where I'm trying to fit a single loud galactic binary. You're gonna hear a lot about that next. And so the right answer is that there is one single source in the data 
But the transdimensional model is able to get close enough with its proposals to eat up a little bit of the excess power. And so you turn the sampler on and quickly it sort of saturates the total number of features it's allowed to fit in the data. And they're all sort of fighting over each other trying to fit the same feature. And it takes a very long time for that model to burn in and get down to the most parsimonious solution, which is that there's just a single source in there. So these burn-ins can be uh, debilitating in length if you don't have some, some clever ways of proposing new fits and getting rid of existing ones. And all of that should make you very nervous about how robust your sampler is. So if you have to do a lot of work to initialize the sampler, and if you have to do a lot of work to guide its hand in its sampling, then it should make you uh, concerned about how robust those results are. So, so these are not really like off the shelf plug and play kind of algorithms where you can just always blindly trust what comes out. They require uh, a little bit extra tender loving care in development and also in testing to make sure that, that you're getting uh, good robust results from them. Okay, so I'm running pretty close to the end, but just to recap, uh, especially in the LIGO context, we have this super large dimensional model. None of the parameters, almost none of the parameters we actually care about. So the goal is to just marginalize over as much as possible. Uh, and a quick tour of where these get used in current LIGO, Virgo, Kagra analyses. Uh, so our combined uh, noise and glitch model get used to provide point estimates of the noise spectrum before LIGO, Virgo parameter estimation. Uh, you can throw in the signal model as well. And this sort of combination of the model gets used to come up with a point estimate for glitches that then get uh, subtracted from the data as a pre-processing step before the um, gravitational wave parameter estimation analysis. Uh, we also have uh, a setting where we just use the, the signal model wavelets and a lot of the, and, and all the same pre-processing that would get used for the CBC parameter estimation to do a template-free waveform reconstruction. So we can compare the sort of data-driven waveform reconstruction versus the model-driven waveform reconstruction and, and see if they agree. Spoiler alert, so far they all have. Um, you can throw all this stuff into the mix and, and we have searches for unmodeled gravitational wave transients. So gravitational wave bursts, where we can use this as a detection pipeline and also a characterization pipeline. And then there's a bunch of new stuff in development for 04, no spoilers, but seeing how much of, the, of these uh, phenomenological models that we can incorporate into the actual CBC analysis as well, instead of using all this stuff as basically pre-processing. Um, and we also have similar algorithms in development for LISA, which you're gonna hear about next. And I think that's my last slide. And so hopefully we have time for some Q and A.